Well, welcome everyone who's here tonight. Um, it's a little bit after 5.30, so we should get started um, uh, here promptly so we can we can take the full hour here with our, our council member elect. Um, but I wanna welcome everyone um, to San Jose Arts Advocates. Uh, it would be a Meet Your City Council forum. And hopefully this is a first in a series. Um, we've had a, we had the pleasure of hosting a couple candidate forums um, with the candidates for the runoff elections that were just to hope well, almost decided, I guess they're still counting votes, um, but we're, uh, we're voted upon most recently. Um, but today we're gonna be getting to know a council member who's gonna be coming into office in January who was elected in the March primary. He was lucky enough to receive 50% uh, plus one, as we say, of the vote, or actually quite a bit more than 50% of the vote in the primary, which meant that he was elected outright. So um, he has had the opportunity to spend um, some time really uh, uh, adjusting to uh, the potentials of the new office and, and working on his transition. Um, but uh, tonight he's uh, graciously offered to spend an hour with us and the creative community to talk about um, arts and culture in San Jose and um, you know his thoughts on that and some, uh, some thoughts that we have. And I'm gonna go ahead and rename myself because I'm realizing that I'm named after my business. All right, there we go. Yeah, that's me. So, um, so welcome, uh, Matt Mahan. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little uh, a brief bio about Matt that he was gracious enough to share with us or, or share with me earlier. But I'm not gonna be, not gonna embellish too much. I hope. Um, but <laughs> uh, so Matt grew up um, over the hill, as it were, in Watsonville, um, and came to San Jose during high school on a work study scholarship uh, for low income students. He's graduated from Harvard, uh, and studied po politics, philosophy, and economics, or PPE and came back to San Jose to be a public school teacher, thank you very much, um, in East San Jose at uh, Joseph George Middle School. Uh, later, Matt transitioned into software where he built two venture-backed companies that promoted civic engagement by building tools for voters to organize around issues and candidates they support. And that was uh, Causes, if folks remember on Facebook. Um, and then uh, that later that uh, morphed into Brigade, which is his most recent venture. Um, and he'll be starting as the, the D10, District 10 City Council member on January 1st. District 10, for those of you who are not as familiar, is in South San Jose. It's primarily Almaden and Blossom Valley areas. It also includes Vista Park around Gunderson High School. Um, so, uh, and he's married uh, to his lovely wife, Sylvia. They have two children, Nina and Luke. Nina is three and Luke is one, and they live in Blossom Valley. So Matt, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to chat with you all. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm going to start. We'll start off with some uh, sort of prepared questions and, and topics, but we're going to keep the conversation um, flowing uh, as much as we can. Make it. We get a little more, a little less formal than a, a forum or a candidate uh, debate, because as we already <laughs> covered, uh, you do not have an opponent at this point. So we can we can sort of have. So a, glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> we can have more of an open conversation. So um, we'll start off um, with something. Uh, somewhat somewhat light um do you have any creative passions yourself any anything that you uh, you enjoy as far as creative uh, getting your creative juices flowing and if so what are those things yeah i um you know my personal passion i, I hope this counts um it's not not a fine art or anything but my personal passion is is actually gardening and then and then learning how to cook whatever i grow so i do a lot of vegetable gardening gardening some flowers um in fact my Daughter and I just took out the uh, the park strip between the sidewalk and the street in front of our house and landscaped it with some native plants. And so that's kind of my my personal creative outlet. But um, I, I also paint a little bit, and I've I'm always just very impressed with folks who are who are really creative. I know we we all are in our own way, but um, you know I have family members who are really into music and and um, and, and painting and those sorts of things, and I I, I love it. I think it's uh, it's awesome. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about art in our in our city. Nice. Well, that's that's actually a pretty good segue. Um, and this is a a question. Um, it's more. It's kind of a more general question. But a, looking back at your um, in your campaign, you position yourself as a strong advocate for San Jose's neighborhoods. Um, something on your uh, website, I want to say, uh, in your platform was a great city starts with great neighborhoods. And yeah. for, for San Jose, the path to protecting and improving quality of life begins with standing up for our neighborhoods. Do you have any thoughts on how San Jose can build stronger experiences of place and identity in our neighborhoods, particularly using arts and culture or leveraging uh, creative community? 
Well, that's a great question. And, and you're right. I, I did really try to focus on the neighborhoods. You know, I, I, during the campaign, my, my strategy was very simple. I basically just went out and knocked on doors for nine months, every single day, knocked on about 10,000 doors. And when I talked to people, they, it was, it was really an interesting experience. They, they were not interested, at least with me in discussing the big national political debate of the day, they were very interested, and maybe this is because we have educated voters who understand what the city does, they were interested in their parks, libraries, community centers, um, the, the potholes in the street in front of their home, the, the basic quality of life issues that impact people every day, public safety also being a big one. And um, I think we have a really uh, a great model down in District 10 that I'd like to bring to more of our neighborhoods. And it's, it's by no means the, the only example of this. It's just one that I'm familiar with, which is the Martin Fontana Parks Association. And so this is one of our local parks where the neighborhood has just embraced the park as the place where they are going to invest in a public space where they meet one another, where they exercise, they enjoy nature. They've even incorporated um, art in the sense of taking. So, so you wouldn't actually think of this as a park that the community would rally around necessarily. It actually has the PG&E lines going through it. And so you could look at it and say, well, these big you know, PG&E towers and, and these big scary lines. But um, actually the community got organized when PG&E wanted to cut down the oak trees that were under the lines. And since then, this neighborhood association has done an incredible job of bringing in more native plants, caring for the trees, building a dog park, and taking some of the transformers that are on the ground. I think they're transformers, don't quote me on that, but the PG&E boxes that are there and painting them and doing really just beautiful um, paintings on, on top of and around these boxes. So when you walk by them, they've gone from being this sort of impersonal metal box that's painted green um, or concrete, boxes or were and then instead it's it's like a beautiful painting of a of a pond or a forest or and so i just you know i think it's just one little example but the way in which the community there organized and decided to embrace this public space and turn it into something that everyone could really benefit from it's such a joy to walk through that park and so it's one little microcosm but i think if we can empower every neighborhood to find its little public corners, whether it's the sidewalk or a parklet or a bigger city park or whatever it is, and, and take real ownership of it. And the city ought to be, in my view, and I'll, I'll pause on this point, I really think the city ought to be a platform for citizens to get involved. We can't just send our tax dollars to city hall and assume everything's gonna be done by the city and its staff. We're just, we don't have enough resources for that. But where the city can, create the structures and the support and maybe a little bit of funding to help the neighborhoods take uh, a little more ownership of the space around them and then create whatever they whatever their vision is. That's something I, I think is really promising and, um, and I'd like to see more of. Nice. Well, building off of that, I know we wanted to, um, we wanted to get into talking about the role of the city council, right? And you, you, I think this is a great segue, the role of the council in terms of promoting and supporting arts and culture um, and cultural life in San Jose. But before speaking to that, just in building up that last point, um, what we were also really interested in um, promoting local artists and making sure that um, our local arts community has opportunity and access to opportunities for, you know, uh, requests for proposal and other, uh, other public art projects within the city. When it comes to you know neighborhood projects like that, um, what would your thoughts be on you know how we can best connect those neighborhood groups with you know with the artists and the creative community? Good question. I'm, I'm not sure that I um, have a, an answer yet. I mean, potentially working through a third party organization. I'm just within the theme of empowering the community. I'm big on finding community based organizations to to play that kind of role. So I'm not sure it needs to be centralized within City Hall, perhaps an organization like, like you all could help facilitate that kind of, that kind of exchange. I think, well, I think we'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah, part of our, um, at least we sort of have a, a three-pronged approach to what we're doing so far with SJAA and that's um, advocacy, obviously. So um, fighting for, for uh, more funding, more recognition, more support, um, but just, and, and also, um, uh, just more awareness, really, um, and then 
education. So, um, and that's not just educating the community, the broader community, but also educating our own community, our creative community about um, civic life, right? And about uh, ways to ways to engage, like you're talking about. Um, um, and then educating uh, folks like you, folks who are, are now decision makers and are able to to um, really bring that that power to the bear um, on these issues. So. Thank you for that. So what um, what would you say then, building up that is um, the role of, say, a city council member or the city council in, you know, supporting and or promoting arts and cultural life in San Jose and more of a creative culture here? Yeah, I, I think it's important because arts and culture are a fundamental component of quality of life. And I think ultimately city government ought to be thinking about quality of life broadly. And that's not to say that there isn't some hierarchy of values. I'm big on focus and prioritization. I don't think the city can do everything, but um, unlike a school board where the mandate is pretty narrow, super important, but, but very focused, I think that city council becomes, or, or take a transit district, same thing, very focused goal of helping people, helping the public, cost effectively move from point A to point B. Um, the city really is the lowest level of government that has a more general mandate is I guess what I would say. And so when I went around knocking on doors, it was very clear to me what the top priorities were and I plan to be responsive to the community's needs. Uh, you know, I, typically, and this was certainly true and my door knocking, public safety was again and again, the top thing that came up. That is the most fundamental promise of local government that uh, it will keep you safe. And so everything from emergency preparedness to property crime to uh, you know 911 response times, people brought that up a lot. Um, housing and homelessness was right up there as a top priority. People, um, feel, I certainly feel that it's a moral failing that we live in a society where people are living on the streets. Um, and certainly beyond just homelessness, we have a lot of folks in our community who are housing insecure, as, as we all know. Uh, I've had a lot of friends leave the Bay Area because of the cost of living. And then the third thing that came up was what I'd call infrastructure. And a lot of people brought up the roads down in district 10. We don't have as much uh, public transit infrastructure. So a lot of people are getting in their cars to get to work or go to the store or whatever it might be. Um, but, but I'd like to broaden out that infrastructure concept to include a lot of public amenities that did come up. And if you kind of total them all up, they were a top concern. And that includes our parks, our libraries, our community centers, our trails, and you know, while people didn't say public art in those words, a lot of people talked about wanting to take pride in where they live. A lot of people brought up beautification. People brought up trash and weeds because that's what they see along a lot of our roadways and feeling like we haven't had the budget or the, the focus and, and the ability to execute on keeping our city clean. And so, you know, and I don't, I'm, I'm new, newly elected, so I don't have the, the full history behind everything that, that has gone on in the city, but there was definitely as an undercurrent in many of the conversations I had a desire to have a real pride of, of place, pride of ownership in the city from our residents. And I think art plays an important role in that. I think, um, yeah, we should pick up the trash and clear the weeds, but I think people's feeling of belonging and commitment and um, the kind of inspiration within the city is gonna require more than just picking up the trash. I think it's also, you know, allowing the community to, and it's supporting and encouraging the community expressing itself. Um, so I, I think art actually does play a role in that sort of fundamental quality of life mandate that the city has. Um, what would you say, you mentioned um, some of the priorities that you heard, you heard from residents, obviously, and the priorities that, you know, as someone who has run for office myself and run a lot of campaigns in San Jose knows come up a lot. Public safety is obviously usually top of the pops when it, when it comes to um, issues that you hear. Um, yeah. And I do appreciate um, and agree that I think a lot of the times folks may not have the words for it. They may not say the word public art. They may not even say the word art, but they, or even culture, um, but they certainly know it and they feel it around them. Um, and that leads to, um, the unfortunate circumstance of, of sometimes arts and culture being something we can't necessarily quantify the impact of. 
you can do it in economic terms, um, certainly, especially even in San, in San Jose, where we have a really robust creative economy. We have a lot of non nonprofits, but also arts businesses um, that are uh, functioning and employing a lot of our residents, employing a lot of artists. And um, what I'm getting to is uh, you um, you focused a lot on um, you know ways to grow our local economy, right? Um, bringing more middle class jobs to San Jose. How do you um, how would you see uh, how do you see the arts and culture and or, or creative culture fitting in or creative economy fitting into that? And how do you see the creative economy and the hotel and 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 um, entertainment um, and hospitality uh, economy fitting into the the growth and recovery we're going to have to see from from COVID? Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot in your questions, so you might have to um, if I miss any of it, please follow up on it. But I, you know. On the one hand, I, I am a numbers guy. I like to understand the math behind things. You know, are things feasible? Will they work? What will it take? I like to plan and and try to understand how we're going to actually get to where we want to go. But I'll also be the first to admit that the, the the most valuable things in life are often hard and even impossible to measure. So I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it's it's really true. And I think I ran on things that we're often quite concrete. We have a housing crisis. We know it's largely a supply problem. We have more people who either live here or, or want to live here, or there are jobs for than there are housing. So we need to build more housing without getting into how we're going to do that. But that's probably a longer and different conversation. San Jose is in the unfortunate position of having an imbalance. We need more jobs. Um, we don't have the kind of tax base we ought to have because we actually house a disproportionate number of uh, workers in Silicon Valley. And so I ran on those issues because I think they're foundational and they're concrete. And yet I think what shouldn't be missed is as we try to bring jobs, particularly to our urban villages and our downtown core and near transit and places where jobs really ought to be concentrated. And as we work to build more housing, we also have to continue to think about quality of life. These are not purely, we're talking about people's lives and the quality of their life and their ability to, to achieve their full potential and lead good lives. And so they aren't just reducible to a number. It's not enough to just say, we've got to build 10,000 homes or twice, it's actually more than that, 30, 40,000 homes, or that the city needs, you know, 300,000 more jobs to, to, you know, whatever it is, you have to also think about the quality of it. And, um, so I've, I've sort of, I'm not sure, as I was concerned, I may have gone off on a tangent there a little bit, but I, I think the quality piece is key and arts and culture and access to nature and um, space that's safe and beautiful. I mean, these are important things. In fact, I just as one other aside, and then I wanna make sure I get back to answering your question. I supported the most recent Measure T to expand funding or to, to basically extend funding for open space preservation, because to me, that's one of the most important investments we can make in the future. And not just because of our climate crisis, but we're gonna keep growing. And as the Bay Area adds millions of more people, we need to plan ahead and preserve that space where people can go for health and beauty and inspiration and nature is one form of that, but we also shouldn't write off our urban areas and just think of them as these functional spaces that are just supposed to house people and create jobs. They need to also be beautiful, walkable, enjoyable. Um, right. Well, um, and, and then sort of building off that, I guess, getting away from then the more, um, the more aesthetic and, and, uh, and um, quality of life aspects of it when it comes back to the economy. Um, so we're we're obviously um, going through a, a very challenging time um, economically. Small businesses, especially restaurants, hotels, um, your hospitality industry, and the arts industry are suffering right now throughout um, the country, especially in uh, in our area. Uh, we've had uh, you know theater companies that can't have traditional shows. You've got hotels that are you know barely uh, you know accepting any guests because people aren't traveling at this point. So, and that compounds to create even bigger problems because a lot of the taxes that we get from all of that um, that hotel usage um, go into funding the arts. So, as you look ahead towards economic recovery, I know that um, the mayor has really you know uh, been uh, been trying to. You know, work with the council to develop a, a more cohesive plan for how we how we could recover and bring our businesses back. Um, do you feel as though right? It, it seems as though right now that uh, it's kind of staggered, 
and it's not so much based on um, it, it, it's how come how businesses are being brought back are based on varying things depending on who you're talking to and which level of government you're talking to. How do you see the hospitality industry and the and the creative industry playing a role in that recovery because they do employ a ton of people in our in our city and and it's it really is the lifeblood of of you know of generating revenue when we can't generate um, revenue other ways right generating that that tourist revenue so how, yeah take a little bit to any any thoughts you have on how the um, how we can prioritize or or support that industry as we recover. Yeah, I think we need to be really aggressive about trying to protect our um, hospitality, um, arts, culture, the the kind of all of those jobs that are not so easy to do or, or maybe impossible to do remotely. And you're right, our, our kind of lifeblood of downtown, especially, but also just an, an economic driver. And, and they are, you're right. I, I think the, the what we do as a city has to be rooted in science and it's a tough moment obviously we got some good news today nationally internationally i guess that there uh you know maybe a vaccine on the way which is great uh we're also in the midst of this this latest surge if you will which is really scary and so it's a hard thing to balance i don't pretend to have great answers here i and i think with the weather turning colder it's even harder during the summer i advocated pretty loudly for the city to make more investments in our commercial zones and to bring everything outside and to support that with more infrastructure. And what I meant by that is I was going to cities like, um, I was just kind of curious. So I was driving around, checking out different commercial corridors and went to Mountain View and Los Gatos amongst others and noticed that those cities seem to be rebounding the fastest in their commercial corridors because the city was proactively investing in creating barricades and cordoning off space and inviting and encouraging the businesses out into the street. And San Jose has been doing this as well. I think it's hard for a bigger city. We don't have a single main street. So I'm, it's not meant as a critique necessarily, but I think we need to do more to figure out how our businesses can survive and entire industries can survive in this new normal but it does have to be rooted in science. And so what that's gonna take is a partnership with the county and our, and our public health office, because they're the ones who need to make the call on what's safe and how to, do, how to reopen safely. And I wish there was a simple answer to this. Um, obviously masks critical, ventilation is critical, trying to do things as much in open air outdoors is, is important. I'm not gonna pretend to be, um, you know, an epidemiologist um, or public health official. So I, I, I don't want to um, overstate, you know, my role here, but I do think to the extent that the city can make strategic investments. The reason I liked commercial zones, and I think that idea still has merit, is that you may be able to get a critical mass. We may not be able to, we don't have the resources to give grants to every small business in the city to keep them afloat. But if we can identify, say, one commercial zone in each council district, so 10 commercial zones, and make a proactive investment in creating public space where people can safely come back to engage in um, eating, drinking, enjoying um, entertainment, uh, you know, live music, whatever it might be. I think that would be really neat and, and, and that should be doable. I mean, we ought to, as a city, have the resources to pick a small number of commercial zones and really double down on them and make them a place where people feel safe and want to come back and engage. So I think there are strategies. I don't think there's a silver bullet. Yeah, no, I would agree with you there, but thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for the answer. And I wanted to uh, just give a shout out. Um, so Yuri uh, Seeger and Dana Harris, they're the founders of the School of Visual Philosophy. They're on our core mm -hmm. team and there are our host tonight. Yori, did you want to give a quick plug for, um, hey, there they are. I don't know if you guys wanted to give a quick plug for Safely Social San Jose and your your concept for bringing back some of this social life within the con the constraints of what we're going through right now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we were asked to join a, um, a task force with District 6. and No, one, District 3. Sorry, District 3. We're in District 6. And one of the things that um, the task force and, and we came up with is a concept of safe, Safely Social San Jose. And it's exactly what you're talking about, is how do we, as a culture, restart our sort of grassroots movements and, and recreate a new social dance based on what we have to do to stay safe and, and, and keep open once we have our businesses 
um, bringing customers back in. And the best way that I describe it is when you take your mask off, you gotta think of yourself now as a smoker. So it used to be that you could smoke anywhere you wanted to, and now you can't have your, your mask off anywhere you want to. And just to have the respect for other people, because we don't know what, what everybody's situations are. We don't know yeah. if your neighbor is has a precondition or lives with somebody who is. And how do we socially really pay attention to what we take for granted in terms of what we do in a normal day? And how do we really interact with people so that way we do this safely and we make um, all of our citizens feel like they want to go out and be with people and not be afraid that they're gonna contact people that don't have that respect for everybody. So I can blab about this forever, but in the <laughs> elevator pitch version, uh, what we're trying to do is, and we're getting funding for, we're our part, the School of Visual Philosophy is teaching um, team building workshops. And that could be yeah. for businesses, for people personally, um, and how to arts organizations to spread this word and, and develop sort of a new cultural norm for, for our time. But we'd love to talk to you about yeah. it more and, and see how your office might like to get involved or not or whatnot. I'd love that. Yeah. Totally blur, you know. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, you're absolutely right. We need new social mores, new social norms. Um, yeah, yeah. Because even with a, you know, with a uh, a vaccine, we're still, you know, it's going to be a long time before we're, you know, fully vaccinated. Um, and it could be yeah. many years, and we'll be dealing with this like, you know, like polio for many, many years to come. So we'll have to adjust a bit um, in, in everything we do already. Um, well, th yeah. thanks so much for um, your answer so far. I think we've been having a, a pretty good, pretty good dialogue. Um, something. Uh, when it comes to the upcoming budget cycle, obviously there's, you know, there are going to be some difficult decisions that have to be made, right? Um, and you've already mentioned um, some of your priorities already. Could you maybe get into an area? Do you think there's an area where you think there uh, could be used for more outside the box thinking, perhaps with either, you know, an organization like ourselves or just pe people from the creative community collaborating on ideas for how to approach uh, a certain policy or a budget area differently? So I ask, um, actually, before you re, I would love it if you'd re-ask it just to make sure I understand the question. I also just wanted to, I, I saw Ron's comment and I really appreciate um, oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yori's comment as well. And I, I just, yeah, I would love for anyone who wants to work on ensuring that the kind of small business arts and cultural scene, we find strategies for reopening and make that a priority with the county. I am, I'm game to try to help. So just wanted to make myself available to anyone who wants to follow up on that front. Uh, but Peter, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understood your question. Could you repeat? Oh, yeah, no, I'm actually, that's a, that's actually a really great point that uh, uh, I did want to make was that any, um, uh, would you be open to on, you know, as task forces are developed, right, and reopening uh, plans are being form, formed, or can you um, commit to, or at least, you know, say, uh, say if you'd be interested in having, um, you know, creative community or artist, artist uh, artistic community input? In that absolutely yeah absolutely and in fact i have um had there have been small businesses in various um sectors where folks have reached out to me and others um asking for an advocate so um a, a dance studio in los gatos for just to give a random example i don't even live in los gatos but i think the owner may live in in my district um and other sorry for the screaming children in the background i have a three-year-old and a one-year-old so that's the the ambiance, um, but uh, you know, and, and so I, you know, I'm not about me, but but various elected officials have been able to push forward that certain industries are being um, overlooked and need more guidance from the public health office. And I think that, and maybe Peter, this starts to get it at your earlier question. Yeah. I think a strategy is to form a task force, lay out some use cases, lay out some suggestions and make sure that a, a champion helps get it to the right people. Because I know the, the hardworking public servants at the county are um, inundated. You know, every, every business, every industry is uh, clamoring for more support and better guidance. But uh, yeah, I think it, it, you all represent a critical part of our life. And so I think it's, I think it's important that your voice is heard. Thank you. Yeah, I was kind of round, roundabout way with the last question of, of getting at um, building off that. Is there a particular uh, budget area um, 
that you uh, think could benefit from more outside the box thinking? Well, oh gosh. Or more or multiple areas. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are many, and you mentioned I'm a former public school teacher, so I have a lot of thoughts on education, but but that's not really under the purview of the city uh, so much. So I'll, I'll leave that aside for now. Um, I mean, one thing I'd, I'd like us to try to figure out is, is how to um, move away from this, this feeling that I often get that um, people think that development in the city is somehow zero sum with other goals. And so I, I try to see, th look at things in a very integrated way and look at for the interconnections. And a, a point I often make, because I consider myself an environmentalist and I'm worried about our climate crisis and think that we need to do more faster. And I love open space and try to get out hiking and every opportunity I get, is that every time that we make it difficult to build um, housing in our urban core, let's say, for example, uh, what that effectively often translates into is just another acre in the Central Valley gets paved over, effectively, because human beings need to live somewhere, they need shelter. <laughs> and um, so I just, I would hope that we can find ways and, and you know, I think true, the reason I bring up that example, it's just one example, is that I think often the development community and the environmental community have often felt like they're um, in, in an oppositional you know, relationship. Um, and sometimes that's true. And, and often there are tough trade-offs to make. So I, you know, but, but I think to the extent that we can say streamline, green light, create incentives for more infill, and maybe, you know, maybe to bring it back to the topic at hand, maybe a developer who opts into uh, setting aside some funding for arts and culture um, or some other, uh, maybe an environmentally friendly goal get, also gets a lower regulatory burden and some streamlining. Maybe there's a, a race to the top model here where we can actually think about how we design incentives in the city to try to achieve outcomes in a way that harness that kind of natural energy that's out there anyway. Because the harder we make it, within the city, the more that, that all that energy and investment goes somewhere else. And I think there are ways to have more of our goals in an integrated way if we're all willing to give a little bit and, and, and you know, have a little bit more trust. And not everything's gonna be perfect, but I just worry that we often take everything in a silo and then try to create a set of rules for that silo and then they don't work together as a whole. And so that's kind of my philosophy. I, I'm speaking in abstract terms here, but um, that was the first thing that popped into my head. I can certainly appreciate that, um, and I, I think it, uh, we would agree it's really important to think of these things in an integrated way. Um, building off of that, uh, and you, you actually kind of referenced it a little bit, um, there is a, uh, should, we shared with you some information before this, but um, uh, there's a, a policy on the, the council's priority setting agenda, uh, ostensibly called public or private percent for art, which, is, which would be a policy that would um, require uh, private developers to contribute either you know some sort of nominal uh, fee to a, a fund for public art or to mm -hmm. install public art or public art or public art space or cultural space in their uh, in their development um, it's in it's the the council has asked staff to work on a proposal and come back at some point um, we're, we're not entirely sure when that's going to be um, but do you have any thoughts on that and how do you think that um, something like you were just speaking to, you know, in terms of um, incentivizing it would, would be more of a, uh, an approach we could take um, as opposed to just strictly, you know, implementing a fee or assessing a fee. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, bringing it to my attention. I appreciate all the background materials um, you shared earlier because I, um, it wasn't totally on my radar, but I'm glad that it is. And I think it's a really interesting, um, you know, policy. And I think, you know, it's sort of akin, at least I think, to um, something that I lived in San Francisco for quite a few years. And I found it kind of amazing that um, large developments had to create some public space. So a parklet or an atrium that was publicly accessible or a rooftop. And over time that just became an incredible public amenity. I mean, there's so many buildings um, downtown that have these incredible parklets or gardens or whatever they are. Um, so I, so I like that concept and I've seen firsthand how something like that can really enhance quality of life and, and create a city for everyone, which is ultimately 
kind of my goal is, you know, San Jose ought to be a, a great city for everyone and in, in every, from every walk of life and every stage of life from, you know, young people to retirees and everybody in between, like my wife and I raising little kids who drive us crazy every day. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I like the concept. The, the only concern I would have back to that idea of thinking in silos and then just layering things is that I'm also a proponent of um, the concept of a universal fee for development, where we don't just keep taking the latest priority that we think is important and tacking on a new fee, and then maybe shooting ourselves in the foot in the long run and building less housing than we want or building or at bringing fewer jobs than we want. And I think that the better way to approach it is to have a universal fee and Maybe it, you know, it, it, presumably that the amount of the fee is going to scale up with the value of the project and then having the discussion about our priorities and how much of that of, of that fee that's being paid for with new economic growth, new economic development is going to parks, roads, libraries, arts and and thinking about it from a holistic perspective to me feels like better policy. And I'd also say, you know, as, as a benefit to having a universal fee and not setting it too high every time we add some housing or we add a new we add more jobs that becomes a permanent ongoing part of our revenue base as a city so while people often have a reflexive not in my backyard view on development every time we add some jobs downtown we now have more ongoing tax revenue that we can use for whatever priorities we have and I think then the conversation becomes, well, what are our priorities? So I'm, I'm interested to see what staff brings back. I think it's a really interesting idea. The example of the public space in San Francisco is something that I always thought was really fascinating and added a lot of value. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting concept and I, I want to learn more about it. Yeah. Good. I think the good news is that in San Jose, especially, we already have uh, some developers who have embraced this, you know, the concept already and even have been proactive. Uh, I can think of a few developers at the one of the Pierce when they were with the uh, the voxel cloud on top of it, where they've proactively stepped up and and worked with the city to to get either public art installed in their property or, or in their or in their uh, their project or, you know, um, uh, other amenities like you're talking about. So I, I think there is a lot of room um to develop a and we think there's a lot of room to develop a really cool policy that could work for everyone so we're looking forward to that coming back um yeah we i just want to call out a few folks in the in the chat um real quickly dave pichelle it's a great almaden and and south, south san jose resident um and an advocate um just wanted he shared a link earlier with a blog uh on the martin fontana park that you mentioned earlier and the the, the association uh the oh, neighborhood great. association that came together around that so if you want to learn more about the artwork that's painted on the utility boxes there. Um, please check out that link that Dave posted in the chat. And then um, uh, Roma Dawson from our, uh, our Arts Commission uh, wanted you to, um, wanted everyone to know that the chair, current chair of the Public Art Committee is actually a D10 resident, Lynn Brown, who you might be familiar with. She's oh very, yeah, very I know active. Lynn, I, yep. So um, she's, the current, she's the current chair of the Public Art Committee of, of the San Jose Arts Commission. And for right. everyone, just so you know, that's the commission that advises the city council on arts and culture in San Jose. Um, so uh, in terms of that, actually, what kind of, um, do you envision, um, you know, I, I, you're not the liaison to the arts commission, but uh, how would you envision your office um, interacting with the commission or, do you, or following, you know, the, the activities of the commission? Would you have a, a staffer who would be obviously not assigned to just the arts, but would you have a staffer who would have that under their uh, yeah, I, I think that would absolutely fall into someone's um, you know policy portfolio, if you will, and they'd be responsible for keeping tabs on the work of the commission and making sure that I'm, you know, aware of of the latest and greatest thinking and um, you know the private percent concept, for example, being something that I'll obviously follow closely when staff issues a recommendation. But yeah, it'll it'll definitely be within the the policy portfolio. And are you putting, are you at this point, you know, you've had a little time to work on it. Are you putting together a staff now? Or are you still hiring folks? Or are you still sort of interviewing? Or, and what do, you, what do you envision your staff looking like in terms of size and roles and things like that, the, the, the nuts and bolts? Or do you not really? Yeah. Are you, are you there yet? <laughs> I, yeah, we're, we're getting there. I'd say we're kind of midstream. So um, uh, Matthew Cavedo, who ran my campaign, is uh, a great San, lifelong San Jose and is uh, going to come in as chief of staff. And um, we've, uh, I think, identified a couple other folks and then we have a few open roles. So, um, and if it's at all 
relevant. I'm uh, Peter, I can send you the links and you can share them with the group. But uh, we have, I think, three openings now that have been posted on the city website. So we're going through the process. And typically for those who you know may not have the context, um, the council office is usually five or six people who staff the council member and have um, a policy, you know, set of policy areas that they look at, as well as responsibilities around community engagement, constituent services, understanding what the community's needs are, communicating information back out, those, those sorts of things. So we're just kind of putting that team together now. Well, we've got a very creative network out there, and uh, some of the, a lot of them are in need of, uh, of good, uh, good paying uh, jobs right now. So <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think we'd be happy to post, um, post links to the opportunities, and I think our network expands beyond that too. So yeah, we'll, we'd be happy to help you find some good people. Awesome. Um, uh, a couple other uh, notes from the chat. Um, maybe you could speak to Roma. Also mentioned the the Google pro uh, project in downtown West, and they've recently, you know, released their proposal. They're going through environmental review. Um, the environmental report is up for comment right now. Can you speak to um, your just your thoughts on that? Is uh, without getting too deep into it, maybe your thoughts on how how it's progressed so far, where you think the um, especially the, the community amenity aspect of it, right? And the housing aspects of it are, and not just the, the commercial and jobs aspect. Um, and, uh, you know, just general thoughts on, on that process and how it's going and how we can best engage with this, with the city as a, an arts community on uh, where it goes from here. Yeah, we'll keep, you know, keep, I think what you're doing is, is important, you know, keep, keep organizing and bringing people together and articulating a vision and, and principles and then advocating. I think that's super important. I, for those of you who don't know, between being a public school teacher, oh, Peter mentioned it, I guess, in my bio, um, and then running for office, I spent a bunch of time building tools for civic engagement. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in community groups, getting organized, advocating, um, and, and driving an agenda. Obviously, it's then responsibility of elected officials to then figure out how to bring those together and balance them and and um, make the necessary trade-offs. But I, I think what you're doing is, is really important. Um, you know, when it comes to Google, you mentioned that some developers are uh, particularly forward-looking and um, really kind of bringing a new spirit to economic development in San Jose. And, and I put Google in that category. I've, I've been very impressed with what they've what they've done. I think certainly um, they have the means to do this, but relative to most developers, they, they're really going above and beyond. And um, unlike the old walled garden campuses that our tech, our local tech giants have typically built that are, you know, some central buildings surrounded by an ocean of a parking lot um, you can only drive to. I think, you know, Google's desire to be next to a transit station to open up onto the river to make investments in public space really important i think it's important that all of us and and um, particularly you all as advocates are continuing to say how important it is that the space that there be great public space great public art that it be accessible those kind of you know aesthetically pleasing etc but um yeah i think google is kind of setting a new bar which is exciting I have spoken with some other uh, developers who own a bit of land in downtown, including Urban Community and Urban Catalyst, who I think also have that kind of forward-looking vision, which is really, I'd call it what Tocqueville called self-interest well understood. If, if you think long, if you're invested for the long term, I think you, which, which I think all of these folks are, Google's talking about bringing 20,000 employees for you know, what could be a century or more. Um, we'll see how, you know, how it goes, but, um, you know, urban, urban community, urban cows, these, these guys are thinking about the long-term investment. They're not just trying to flip a, a, a parcel and make a quick buck. They understand that if it's beautiful and environmentally sustainable and includes public space and unique retail, and it, it has a sense of place. Uh, that it'll ultimately work better. It'll be more valuable um, from an economic standpoint. And so I'm, I'm excited about that. I think that's the future of development. And we're lucky to have some real champions who, who believe in San Jose and think that way. I also caution being in the role that I'm now entering into. I also say, keep in mind that if you push too hard on every type of developer and every development, we will only have the really big ones with really deep pockets. And I think we need to think about scaling up our expectations and our demands based on the size of the development and, and 
you know, I just, I, I think we also want to leave room for smaller, uh, smaller developers, smaller businesses. So it's complicated. We want to have an ecosystem, which means diversity, which means we can't have one size fits all expectations, but I've been really happy with, with what Google's doing. And to sort of building off of that, what are your thoughts on what the city can do around um, preventing displacement, not just of residents, but of small businesses and, um, you know, particularly, obviously, arts businesses, um, but but small businesses in, in, in general in San Jose, because I know that the primarily it's because of prop, you know, as property values rise, it's just it becomes uh, less and less tenable for some of them to to pay the rent and, and you might see you know some property owners selling. So, um, and, and the property is turning yeah. over. So any, any thoughts on what this, I know the city's doing a lot and they're exploring ways to, to do this, but any thoughts that you have on strategy? Yeah, I have a few. I mean, I think through one lens and you know, I don't want to be overly reductionist about this. To some extent, the, the housing crisis in San Jose and it's really regional and, and statewide in, in our coastal areas um, and the challenges of retail particularly in an area like downtown are actually two sides of the same coin, which is that we don't have enough residential density. So to some extent, I would argue that if we build more housing and I would say all of the above, yes, affordable with public subsidies to the extent possible, to the extent that the public is willing to tax itself to make those investments, um, but also market, market rate, people coming in and investing because it makes sense. Um, and, and I'll give a quick plug for including that market rate, even though sometimes uh, people look down upon it. Um, ultimately, we got to match up the number of people, and the number of units. And when my wife and I were living in San Francisco, we ended up in a rent controlled apartment because it was the only unit available to us. And the whole time I felt guilty that we were in an apartment that was rent controlled when we could have afforded something more. And so part of, and I'm going to get around to the retail piece, but Part of solving our housing crisis is just about having units be in better balance with our population and our job growth. And so as we build those units, even market rate, that means one less person working at a tech company who's going into the rental market at the, at the kind of lower cost end of that market, out competing somebody else who doesn't make as much. It's one less unit that is being grabbed by that tech worker. And they all, you know, everybody needs a place to live. So my my view is, and I don't think that one district should bear all of the housing production, but for downtown in particular, um, and I think this is true in a lot of areas where we have commercial zones, if we built more housing around that urban village model, not just necessarily upzoning the whole city in one fell swoop in a uniform way, but we concentrate and build up in near transit and in commercial zones, you could create more housing for everyone and lessen that uh, that that pressure on the housing side, but you would also start to have a walkable city where ground floor retail would start to really work. And I think the fact that so many of us in San Jose live out in our suburban neighborhoods and get in our car actually makes that um, that more unique, local kind of bespoke retail experience that you find in San Francisco and New York and it just it's harder in a more suburban car centric city. And so I kind of think that, uh, and I don't think this will solve everything. I mean, the truth is the more you, the more development there is, you're always going to have gentrification pressures. And I think you have to figure out if you're going to allow more building, how to also compensate people who suffer as a result. So I, I don't pretend that these are simple problems, but when I look at a place like downtown that relative to other vibrant downtown urban areas in the country really just lacks residents, just doesn't have a lot of housing stock. You could put a big dent in our local housing crisis and cost of living crisis and support retail by just building a lot more housing of all for all income levels. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I, I think these things can, again, we can take an integrated approach to solving some of these problems. Yeah. And so a lot of it has been a sort of, is a chicken in the egg scenario, right? Where you, um, you know, the retail thrives because there's people there to use it, right? And to walk around and to, and to, to, um, to take advantage of it. So um, we need to, we need to be thinking both ways. That's why I think the city is pursuing you know, a lot of mixed use um, development, uh, integrated developments like the Google campus, hopefully. Um, so uh, thank you for, for referencing that and for having that perspective. Um, so a question from um, Ron, one of our fabulous um, uh, arts commissioners, soon to be former arts commissioner, but um, uh, one of our core team members, um, who's also a 
just a fantastic advocate um, at the state uh, and local and just regional level and a great accordion player, by the way. Um, oh, good to Ron know. notes that there's an increasingly popular model uh, that cities and counties are looking at to place artists in residence in government agencies. This is sort of to our uh, conversation earlier about you know creative uh, uh, problem solving. Um, because artists can provide a new perspective on solving complex problems or issues that governments face. What are your sentiments on potentially placing an artist in residence in a specific city department in San Jose? And could, was, is there any department you think it would be particularly beneficial? It's a really interesting concept. I, I will say that um, in the two tech companies that I ran, I spent about a decade in tech, um, the, the people who I love talking to were the creatives in the company, the designers and, um, and the, the folks who were, who were truly creatives, artists who thought about things, who thought about a different possible, a different world essentially. And I, I often came from more of the partnerships and, and the business side of things and just general management. And I loved, I loved hanging out with our kind of generative creative types in the company um, because they give you that sense of possibility and, and inspiration. And so I do, I do see the value in that. And in fact, there were, um, you know, times in the company where we would go, you know, spend an afternoon at IDEO or go hang out with, with folks who really specialize in that kind of creative design thinking approach. So I can see the value. Um, how we get the city, <laughs> I'll tell you, I was, I was just posting one of my job openings and I, I was thinking, trying to think a little more creatively about the communications role to be more like content creation, like actually doing graph, a lot of graphic design and, and helping to explain to the public what the city's doing in a more visual and, and using audio and video, but just like a much more um, sensory accessible way. And there's just, there's no job, there's literally no job description that I'm allowed to hire for that fits that. Like that we have, I mean, there are existing templates that we, you know, basically have to use. So, right. Um, right. so I tried to kind of shoehorn my ideas into an existing template. So I guess I just say that that government is slow and and can be a little bureaucratic. So it's going to take some work. But um, there are people inside City Hall who are pushing for more design thinking, more creativity, more open ended creative problem solving. Starting with you know thinking about the better future and then figuring out how to get there. So I'm going to be a champion for that in City Hall. And this idea of a, an artist in residence is, is a really interesting one. I'll have to think more about which department. I mean, it's, it's a good idea, but I don't want to just say, well, yeah, go go put it, you know, in the police department or something. I think we got to figure out that maybe, maybe it would be great in the police department. I don't know. Um, but that's a good one. I'd love to follow up on people's thoughts on that. It's interesting. Sure, yeah. And, and Yori also knows that um, Dana and him and he have been working on a, an arts ambassador model for city government too. Um, so, and I know that, um, oh, cool. if, you know, and uh, I should give a shout out. Uh, Dana is an arts laureate this year as well with S, um, with S3 Creates. So she's, um, she, a part of her, that role is to spread the, the, the word and to build the public hope for, for arts out there. So um, certainly awesome. something we're interested in talking with you about. So thanks, thanks for that. Right. Um, it's getting up to uh, getting close to 6:30. We got. I wanted to get to a couple um, other uh, questions, but if anyone else has any other thoughts or, or comments from Matt, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And if we can't get to them today, or we can't get to them in the context of this forum, I'm sure Matt wouldn't mind um, you know following up and giving us some answers we can get out to you um, later. And this won't be the last. Com this will, this is your, your your incoming now. So we got you for the next at least four years. So awesome. we'll, we we will be talking. Um, and speaking to that. Um, uh, there's something I did want to bring up with you because uh, uh, it's been on the minds of a lot of folks in San Jose lately around the elections. Um, but like a lot of cities um, all around the country right now, we're experiencing in San Jose a lot of social tension. Um, and especially in 2020, we've seen uh, quite a bit of it in a lot of different ways. Um, some ways, um, I think, or it seems that we're more civically engaged. In other ways, it feels as if we're talking or we're in some cases yelling past each other. Um, I want to, and this is from uh, Brandon Rawson, who's on our core team. Uh, Harvard sociologist and public policy professor Robert Putnam described the arts as a un as unique from other forums for building civic life, such as community meetings and school board politics. And his quote was this: "The arts represent perhaps the most significant underutilized forum for rebuilding community in America." And I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm sure we'd all love to hear your thoughts, uh, given the recent context around you know negative campaigning and some of the um the the tropes that we've seen used by some of our independent expenditure committees out there and then of course recently with the sbo committee 
um, uh, getting himself into uh, some serious hot water. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can build a more robust and healthy civic life here in San Jose, especially given your background in civic engagement online, um, and then ways that art, the arts can play a role in that. Yeah, it's a great question and good one to close on. Um, although we can try to get to any in the chat, obviously, if, if we have time. Um, I smiled earlier because I actually took a class uh, taught, co-taught by Robert Putnam when I was in college. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of Bowling Alone and, and his other work. Um, and I, I agree with him. I, you know, when it comes to the independent expenditures, First of all, I think what the SVO put out was reprehensible, and I was one of the first people to publicly comment on that. And I, I think they're um, facing a reckoning now for good reason. And obviously, there had been a, a more than one isolated um, instant, which I think is part of why the um, reckoning has been so swift and severe. And, and it's, it's important. I think to the more positive side of your, so I guess the, to, to finish the thought on the IEs, you know, unfortunately, the, the candidates often get kind of knocked around by these much bigger outside entities. And, and a lot of voters don't realize that the candidates have uh, often, you know, no interaction or and are actually legally limited from communicating with those outside groups. In fact, those groups per uh, Supreme Court decisions and interpretations of the First Amendment are allowed to raise as much money as they want and say whatever they want effectively, almost. Um, and the candidates are not allowed to quote unquote coordinate with or, or communicate with them about the campaign. So what often happens is you'll have outside groups and you know business groups, labor groups, those tend to be the two big categories. That's not to say that there aren't other outside groups, but usually um, you know, you'll have your chamber of commerce and you'll have, um, you know, a, a umbrella labor group. We certainly have that in San Jose. Most cities do and other entities that will spend money. And I remember in my campaign, a, uh, luckily we didn't have a lot of negative advertising in our race, which was really fortunate, but I remember an IE sending a piece out on my behalf and it was just not my message. And it was very frustrating because my face was on, it. um, but you're literally not allowed. So, so that's a real challenge. Um, I would say the best antidote is, is education and organization. And to the extent that, you know, we through grassroots groups can get people to come together to learn about issues and get beyond the talking points. The reason I tried to, I know at times in our conversation, I got a little abstract because I really think these issues are nuanced and complicated and we need a holistic approach. And that's not simple. I think it takes conversation like the one we're having to think, more deeply about the issues and get really informed so that we can get beyond the idea that developers are just greedy or labor unions are just rent seeking or whatever, whatever the critiques are. I don't, I don't know, but whatever, whatever the negative view is, we got to quit talking past each other because what I found is generally speaking, almost everybody wants the same things. We just disagree about how to get there. And so that's really, that's why I believe in dialogue and civic engagement, because if we can just have better conversations, I think we may move faster toward our goals. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, a, again, there's no silver bullet, but um, I think what we're doing tonight is important and we need to get more people in the conversation. Well, thank you. I think that's a really good note to, for us to wrap up on uh, for tonight. And I, again, I'm Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here with us and to, to, to meet with the, the creative community. We would love to continue this conversation um, and we're looking forward to, um, to working with you uh, as you progress on the city council. So congratulations on your, your victory in March. Thank <laughs> and, you. and again, thank you for being here tonight. Any, any thoughts you want to leave us with um, beyond that? Um, well, it, was my, it was my pleasure. I, I really appreciate the invitation. I'd love to stay in touch. Uh, we need to draw on all of our creative energy to get through this crisis and to build the kind of city that we, that we all want to live in. So uh, please, please be in touch. Uh, would it be, Peter, can I send you uh, my contact info and for you to share with the group would that work absolutely and, and if you want you can even type it into the chat right now and we could um if you if you feel comfortable and we can sure share yeah it. yeah well i'll, I'll at least um and while, while you're doing that i'll just let you know that um so matt Cavedo is getting plenty of love in the chat um from, from multiple locations so you've you've obviously chosen a good chief of staff well deserved so we'll, we'll look forward to working with with him um we definitely know him um, that's my that's my personal email and i am a little inundated without any staff right now so i might be a little bit slow but please feel free to reach out awesome and then um i'm gonna go ahead and put my 
personal cell phone in there. It's still, it's my 831 area code, but. Um, nice. Keeping it real in Watsonville. I like that's that. That's right. Yeah, I still, <laughs> still have that number. Um, awesome. And you can also find me on um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm, I'm pretty active. Excellent. Yeah, we'll get the, we'll get that information out there for sure, so folks can uh, can get uh, get in touch with you. And again, thank you so much for for the time. I know you got a busy night going on, so uh, I will let you get back to it. And and uh, and once again, um, we're looking forward to working with you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate everybody's time. Have great. a great evening. Thanks everyone for being here. And this video will be posted on our Facebook and our website as soon as we get it processed. <laughs> awesome. Talk to you soon. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Peter. No problem. Thanks, Matt. <laughs>